Hey everyone, good morning. My name's Sean from the Youthy team, and I'm lucky to be joined by Ralph Etchmendia, uh, the ethical hacker. How are you doing, Ralph? Good, I'm doing great, man. Thank you. Right, as soon as we put this in the books, I was kind of thinking, ethical hacker? Never heard of this term before. How did you get into it? What what even is that? How did you get into it? Well, I got into it really young. At around uh, 13, 14 years old, I got into computers as a hobby, really. And, uh, you know, this is well before the security industry became a thing. Um, in fact, there was no such thing as cybersecurity at the time. Um, but it was really just kind of uh, seeing what computers could do uh, and what I could make them do. And then eventually that became a career. Um, you know, the hobby became a career. Now, the ethical part is uh, come about really more because of uh, permission, the ability to, you know, to test. That's the, that's the, the term we'll use is to test the security of, of a system, a company, an individual uh, technologies. And so uh, it became a, you know, bona fide industry now, a multi-trillion dollar industry around the world. And uh, again, I, I would never thought that that was going to be the case. It was really just a, a hobby initially when I started. So, um, but that's how I got into it. And, and actually, the way that in the early days I got into into the sort of ethical part of it was, I thought, well, it'd be at the time there wasn't many people who were teaching the process of penetration testing, is what we call it, uh, or ethical hacking. And so I, I wrote a class, and I thought that was the first thing. That I can do is is to make it something educational where people can learn how to test themselves, right? Um, and then that you know became I've done you know, hundreds, I have hundreds, if not over a thousand students over the years that uh, that are now you know positioned in all kinds of companies and government and you name it. Well, is it is it hard to keep up with all of the the changes? I mean, it feels like every year there's some kind of new technology, new AI. Well, yes, I think you know. I'll, it, it's it, to, to some degree, it's like a sport in the sense that the younger uh, generations are, are even better, right? Um, they're faster uh, because they're they're exposed to the technologies uh, much earlier. Um, but as far as keeping up, that is how I keep up for the most part is through uh, a lot of my uh, other hackers that are younger than I actually, you know. Uh, into what's what's hot and again there's a lot of resources online now you have to keep in mind that when I started there were no resources in fact there was no browser yet so you know mm -hmm. really getting information was is, was something that only a very few people knew and you had to know how to connect with them you know so uh, but it is a very 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 uh, advanced world now when it comes to information sharing around these type of issues, right? So uh, the community is a, is a very large and global one. Wow. And so if someone, if someone watching now is interested, how how do they go about getting into this field? Is it something you go to college, university? Is it now more mainstream? Uh, there is, uh, there is now, yeah, it is now mainstream. Uh, now colleges and universities do have uh, courses in these areas of cybersecurity. Um, but there's also a lot of like, you know, the stuff I used to teach were five day boot camps, right? So it was, uh, oh. of course, there's a prerequisites that you come in with, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, nowadays, I mean, the truth is you can even learn a lot of this stuff just by taking the time online because all of it is online now and you have so many resources, uh, even, even for, you know, what you call labs, the actual doing it and trying it against your targets. There's even environments online that allow you to target them and and use your hacking skills against them so i mean it's all really online all you need is google to start cool what last question because i'm so in, i feel like i could talk about this for a long time what's the what's the part of your job that gets you most excited what part do you it keeps you keeps you going in it well the thing is that you're always going to find something is, is the truth. In, in most cases, you're going to find uh, some kind of an issue, right? Uh, I use the analogy if you walk into a, a hippie bar and everybody's peace and love, but you keep pushing the people <laughs> in the bar, somebody's going to push back. And that's kind of the issue when you deal with these technical environments. Uh, there's so many different components of technology being used that 
it's just a matter of time before you find something, right? And when you find something, that's kind of, um, you know, the one, one way I like to explain it is sort of like picking a lock. And if you've never picked a lock in your life before, try it. Um, and there's that moment where, where you actually feel the, the lock click, right? And when that happens, there's a certain feeling that happens. It's like, I got this, right? Um, and I think that's, that's really it. I mean, the, the thrill is that of, I got this, right? And whether you spend a lot of time or little time. There must be, there must be like a competitive edge as well. Because you know you, you mentioned there's a community, like you all very must be so. in, Yeah, do you compete with each other to kind of? Oh, absolutely, up? very much so. I mean, co competition has been uh, at the root of computer hacking. You know, uh, from the from the beginning, as far as I, I remember, you know, uh, it's always competitive, and it's always wow. like, hey, you meet another hacker, you're like, oh, what do you know? You know, <laughs> and this 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 kind of competitive edge is always there. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. So as soon as, as soon as we put this online, we we got some same as me, some immediate interest. Uh, we had people submit questions across all the Ufi touch points, the community, the app, um, even some of our team as well. Uh, so let's just dive straight in. So I've got a, a pretty pretty in depth question here. So it starts off in this day and age with so many advanced targeted AI and tailored algorithm systems. How is it we can't block major email spammers? These bad guys are sending send in millions of emails. So how hard can it be to flag original sources and delay for verification before actually sending? Well, actually, interestingly enough, yes, AI has, uh, you know, has, 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 you know, I call it IA, intelligent automation. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, what we've done is uh, computers have always been a method of automation, right? And and now with uh, AI, it's really more intelligent automation that we're dealing with. Interestingly enough, it, of course, this is a tool used by the bad guys and of course by the good guys. AI, uh, in actuality, is helping in many ways improve email security by detecting and basically mitigating sophisticated email attacks like phishing, malware, and more commonly these days, a lot of ransomware attacks. Uh, these tools basically are being used to analyze email patterns and the content itself to identify any kind of deviation, any unusual threats, any potential threats. Uh, for example, the use of natural language processing and NLP is being used to interpret the email content and then detect suspicious links, attachments, uh, any kind of uh, questionable language. Uh, and of course, the algorithms can learn from that and evolve, uh, you know, helping with the, with the threat landscape. Uh, and any emerging cyber threats. It's even being used for um, automated incident response and behavioral analysis and uh, anomaly detection, all these different things that AI is being used for. Of course, the bad guys are also using this. Now, we'll say this, over the last 10 years, when it comes to email, uh, companies, those especially providing email services, uh, have invested heavily, heavily into email security. Uh, it used to be that I can get an email into your in inbox very easily, that's no longer the case. Um, so not only just from preventing spam uh, from reaching the inbox, but also from reducing the success rate of phishing attempts uh, and phishing attacks and ransomware attacks. Um, this combination, these popular techniques that are, that are being used, which is phishing and ransomware, um, that is actually a lot harder to do these days than it used to be uh, over the last 10 years. Um, there used to be very little security whatsoever in send mail, and that's all changed. Now, you still have... Uh, companies that have older or legacy email infrastructures that can still be exploited. Um, emails that are being sent internally within a company within the same domain name, that can be an issue. Uh, business critical applications that are still not using encryption, for example, on unencrypted email and, and using legacy uh, infrastructure. Um, social engineering attacks uh, using like similar looking domains. We've all seen some of those. So this is still an issue but if you really look at the numbers uh based on the number of emails that are being sent out which uh, this this question was correct it's in the millions and millions um it's still a lot less than you realize as far as what's actually getting into your inbox if any of you have gmail or any of those type of services just go to spam and see how many are sitting there that you haven't realized are there and it's a lot yeah yeah i was about to say when i've looked in spam i I guess is there 
the way they do these emails, like if I get, I don't know, deliveries quite a lot from Amazon or certain couriers, is the algorithm or AI from these phishing attacks able to say, hey, this dude always has deliveries and it can kind of target me by making me trick me into thinking it's Amazon emailing me or not? You know, you kind of. Um, get oh, yes. I mean, in fact, mechanisms like that have been used, but they're largely based on you know, AI or even non-AI is still ultimately based on the data you have or that the attacker has uh, gotten their hands on, right? There's a lot of big data leaks. Um, I think, to be honest with you, all of them, everyone, including me, you, and everyone else, all of our information has already been leaked, uh, if not once, multiple times, because some companies been hacked. Most, some of them don't even know they've been hacked. And that data is being sold on a dark web or being traded or being, you know, uh, passed around by by attackers. Now the question is what data? It's just an email address and they don't have the context of that you're an Amazon buyer. Um, if they hack Amazon, then imagine, right? They have everybody and they know that those are all uh, uh, customers of Amazon, right? So AI is very much the same way, right? AI is being very slick in putting together the attacks and putting together the content and and all the different attack vectors, the different ways it can attack you from email to setting up a fake website to all of these types of things AI can be very effective in doing, but it's still ultimately based on what it has. So, you know, we have a, a same garbage in garbage out when it comes to data. So if it's being fed garbage, then garbage is what it's going to produce, right? Uh, all so right. it's all based on the input on the data that, it, that AI has. So it would have to have that you are a customer. Of, of Amazon. It would have to have certain pieces of information to use that information to then craft an attack that would fool you. And again, mm -hmm. yes, they could be very good and they can fool you. But then you have to ask yourself, where are they getting that information? Where is that information coming from that they would have all of this information? Got you. Got you. It's such a big topic. Such a big topic. I guess that's why it's important to update your passwords, stay, I don't know. Indeed, yeah. indeed, yeah. indeed, it is. It really is, and it's something you know we take for granted, you know, because it's something we use all the time, and we just don't really give it much thought, right? Until it happens, then you start giving it thought. Mm. So, another question. This one, this one, I feel like is applicable to to Ufi especially. So, on a closed camera system, how accessible is my data to hackers and regulatory agencies? On a closed system, it's not. Uh, it is entirely sitting at your physical location. So when it comes to the legalities around that, if, if there were to be an issue, um, then it's it's up to you. You know, it could be subpoenaed and whatnot, but it's it's your data. It's sitting in your you know in your environment in your hardware. Um, when we say a closed system, you know, to be clear, it's one that's not connected to anything uh, but itself, right? So. It, mm -hmm. There is no connection to the internet. There is no connection via Wi-Fi, or there's no connection. It's just a wired closed system, right? Uh, in in those environments, uh, again, it's really very difficult for. It's not impossible. Now, a hacker can, for example, um, if they had any kind of access, there would have to be wired access, so somebody could actually physically get into the building and connect into the wired network. It can happen. Um, or if they had, there were some kind of wireless, it's not connected to the internet, but there's some wireless connectivity. An attacker could also breach that and get into it. But generally speaking, it's, 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 it's nothing is 100%, but it's, a, but it's one which the risk is much, much less than any kind of an attack or attacker. And then when it comes to regulatory issues, like I said, again, this is sitting in your physical space. So, uh, it's really kind of yours, uh, and, and depending on the legality of what may happen, uh, that that'll vary on, on on how someone can get access to that data since it's physically yours. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So I hope that's answered our, our user's question. Um, so another one. Oh, this one this one's interesting as well. Um, in terms of security, how safe are facial recognition systems? Should we be worried about false positives and false negatives? I mean, not in today's uh, environment. When it comes to, I mean, first of all, facial recognition systems uh, are used as a method of authentication. 
right? Uh, to authenticate that you are who you say you are, and it's much like a fingerprint. In today's environment, uh, it is 99% accurate. So you're not really gonna deal with a lot of false positives and false negatives. But I will say this, that it's just a method of authentication. So like anything else, I always, you know, gonna recommend that if you're gonna use facial uh, recognition, but if there's any way to use multiple factor of authentication, right? Whether it's a password and facial recognition, or it's a password and, you know, or it's facial recognition and then thumbprint or whatever. Uh, it's best to always use more than one. I mean, you have to think that in, in some cases, you know, you can take a really good picture of someone put it in front of a facial recognition system and it might pass, right? So uh, always use multiple factors of authentication and I think the facial recognition is just another one. But when it comes to uh, false positives and false negatives in today's tech use of, the, uh, of that technology, it, it, it's it's pretty solid. Awesome. Again, another great answer. A question for me, actually. Where, how advanced do you think facial recognition is going to get in the next, even in the next year? Is it something very, very advanced? I mean, very, very advanced. Uh, I mean, it's already very advanced. Only in the last few years, it's come a very, very long way. So uh, it, it certainly can, and, and it's going to be interesting too when it's being tested by AI. Because you'd be blown away by what AI can do with, with recreating someone's face. Um, yeah. You know, but then there's certain parts of it that, you know, AI obviously can't have because of a lack of data, right? Um, like, for example, AI doesn't know what the back of your head looks like. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so, so it's interesting when you think about, you know, facial recognition and AI and how those two are going to be. I think that's a good... Uh, you know, uh, that's a good little project to play with to see how how much you can fool facial recognition using AI. Um, but it's it's really come a very 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 long way. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I think this one this one's a great question. Um, how can I best protect myself from a data breach that affects a company? And this one is is one that, like I said, affects us all. Okay, uh, there has been a lot of. Uh, you know, for example, Google has in in, uh, in in Chrome, you can actually, if you've saved any of your passwords in their keychain, uh, it'll show you that there's been a breach. Um, it basically boils down to one thing, monitoring, right? Monitoring the web and the dark web for leaks and that your information is in those files, in those leaks. Um, there are services, just like your credit monitoring services, for stuff like this available now as well. Um, but again, a lot of those are being used also by the companies that provide us with, uh, with our browsers and, and the likes uh, to, to show that. And you'll see that it'll say like compromised passwords. Um, and, and really the old, how can you protect yourself? And again, this is one that's, that most folks just don't do is you know change your password every 30 days, right? Make your passwords past phrases, not words, but something that it's long and, and more difficult to use, you know, multiple characters, use multi-factor authentication, right? Um, that's another one that's really going to be protecting you as an individual, right? Multi-factor authentication is a big one, and it's it's one that's become a lot easier to use. So mm -hmm. that's the, the, the thing I recommend the most, because even if the password is, is, uh, is breached, it still won't work if you're using multi-factor authentication. So... For the most part, that's all you can do. I mean, that's one of the main points, but then any kind of monitoring services and things like that that, that you could use to, to to monitor whether your data is out there. Yeah, I, I mean, I like the, um, someone tries to log in to one of my accounts, I get the text message that says like, is this you? Or it gives you a code and you can be like, hey, I'm, I'm not actually logging into anything right now. So you kind of can get a, a little pre-warning someone's trying to access your account Exactly. In fact, you know, we are slowly heading away from passwords. We are eventually going to be in a passwordless universe because we we have enough information on our devices that identify us, right? Um, and then there's this fact, like you said, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some applications where there is no password. It just uses your phone number or uses your email to send you a code, and it's a one-time code. Yeah. Right? And so somebody would have had access to your phone or your email 
to be able to access that. So things like that, and you're going to see more and more and more where we're going to get to a place where it's not really going to be a password anymore. Um, but then it goes beyond that, right? We're almost talking about authentication again, just yeah, authenticating yeah. that you are. But, you know, of course, it goes beyond that to that question of this individual is, is there's a lot more data out there, right? Um, and uh, it really is a matter of you defining, you know, what is that? I, I recently, last year, did a TED talk, uh, TEDx talk in Miami uh, about privacy. So you guys should check that out. Those of you watching, look it up on TEDx, um, Ralph and Jim India. But because a lot of it, it, you know, it's a 14, 15 minute talk. But ultimately, what I'm trying to say is defining privacy. This is not something that we really have defined right, when it comes to a digital space. In a physical space, we kind of have, right? We, we have a bathroom and it has a door, but are we doing anything wrong in there? No, we all have to do it. We all got to go in there. So, but we haven't really even defined the bathroom on a digital, and we drop the word around, but the truth is, is your email private? No, you give it out all the time. Is your name private? No, you give it out all the time. Your phone number, that's not private either. And we can go down the list of the things that you think, and we identify as privately, or PII, private information, right? But is it really? Have we ever really defined that to be privacy? So, um, you know, check that out, and I think that'll help you to 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 kind of define your own privacy and 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 the meaning of what it, you know what it is if something was to get out there. Yeah, and and like Ralph said, if you want to watch that, we dropped the link in the comments. So check it out. Um, okay. I think this ties in pretty well, actually, uh, talking about privacy. It's how can I protect my home when using multiple smart devices together? Uh, for example, video doorbells, cameras, digital locks. So, yeah, I feel like that's... I, yeah, absolutely it is. I and mean, that's one that's really, you know, you know, no pun intended, you know, it, it's very close to home because it <laughs> is home, right? And uh, it, it, it's a matter of, for the most part, uh, like for example, we're constantly uh, in, in my so far in my time in working with you, we have been constantly looking at how to harden the terminology we use in, in cybersecurity is hardening the systems, right? Making them more difficult. Nothing is impossible, but hardening the systems, hardening mainly the configuration of those devices. So, so for someone like the person asking this question, where you have video doorbells, cameras, digital locks, all these different things is how are they configured and most of them you know tend to be configured via wi-fi is the wi-fi configured to be secure is it using a strong password you know what i mean uh, mm. is it not broadcasting its its ssid in other words is it not broadcasting its name you know some basic simple things that you can do to harden the environment that that you're working and that, that these technologies are working within um because for the most part they don't work entirely on their own right they're communicating in some in some way they're communicating locally like a lot of the unity devices tend to do or they're communicating with the cloud um or you're communicating over the internet so it's a matter of just hardening that those environments the configuration of those tools of those technologies so it's, it's kind of safe to say like but if you're at home start with your wi-fi make sure your wi-fi has a good password make sure your wi-fi is hardened like okay. you said and then yes. add each device one Correct. by one. Yeah. And, and each one, you look at the configuration settings, make sure you only turn on the things you need to turn on, you know, and understand. And in that process, what you end up doing is really understanding what you're using, which is a lot of the problems. We just tend to pop things in and really not give any yeah. thought, um, yeah. which is, in fact, one of the biggest vulnerabilities that, that exist is those kind of default configurations and, and things that we just don't really give any thoughts. We do just plug it in yeah yeah especially in this day and age you know we want everything done quick 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 video yeah, doorbell yeah. turn it on yeah i yeah. got you got you exactly um but you'll feel a lot better once you understand how it works and that you have you've configured it yourself to do what you want it to do and only what you want it to do and if anyone watching wants to to take any of those tips just check out the eufy blog there's um how to set up the doorbells we've got blogs from ralph as well so check those out and uh hopefully yeah that will help you understand how you can protect all your home all your devices all at once um okay this is a good question what am i actually supposed to do if i think my phone or computer has been hacked 
Well, that's a great question. And it's one that I can't tell you how many times I, I hear, right? Because uh, in, in many cases, you haven't been hacked, right? Um, but in some cases, you have. And how would you know? Uh, the truth is, you can't just go to the police, right? You can't go to anyone. It's, it doesn't really work that way. Um, uh, and if, especially if, if, you know, I mean, this stuff is expensive. Cybersecurity is expensive as a service if you're going to go and get it. So most folks can't really do it. Now, there are, you know, some tools, right, depending on what kind of device you have, you know, to have antivirus uh, or anti-malware type of, of uh, applications that you can run every once in a while to ensure that you don't have anything that's well known. Again, some of these hacks that, you know, the the really targeted hacks, but I would say government level type of, of, of hacks are, are using tools that you would never be able to catch. That's the truth, even with antiviruses and all that. But again, are, are most of us a target of that kind of a, of a hack? No, those are very expensive tools to use, even for a government. Um, and again, even for cyber criminals, it, you know, the, the world of cybersecurity has changed in that it's entirely driven by money. And they used to be, to some degree, and when I started, used to be driven by curiosity, but no longer is that the case. And, and again, there's been a lot of structuring of that um, that monetizes those things. So if somebody were to find, say, a, an exploit for an iPhone, um, that's easily worth one or two million dollars. So they're not going to be using it to hack their girlfriend. You know what I mean? Um, it, because the moment you use it, it runs the risk of being identified. It's what right. we call zero day. So, uh, you know, these type of exploits are very highly prized. And so you're not going to see those. So really the answer to that for the most part is that you can, can put some kind of software to, to run, you know, antivirus, anti-malware type software. Now, if you start seeing your phone doing or device doing something just really not normal, you know what I mean? Of course, you can take it to, you know, to, to some sort of service organization for them to check it out, but it's going to be costly. Wow. I guess at that point, is it too late? Is it is it pointless to try and change your passwords? Like, do you, do you contact? No, it's not. I mean, no, you know, it, it not, it's, it's sort of like there's a term for, um, you know, in, in farming she, you know, with sheep. You know, it's all sheep dipping. It's like you you put the sheep into, you dip it into a solution to get rid of the fleas or any kind of bugs it has, right? Um, right. Before you even cut, cut. And that's kind of the same thing you'd have to do here. You'd have to just use a whole other device if you think your device is enhanced. Buy a new one. Um, and before you even get on that, you know, any changes you're going to make to passwords and all that would need to be done on a new device that you know is sheep dipped or... <laughs> You know what I mean? That is that is completely clean, um, and so again, it's expensive, right? Because we're, we're you know, if you're worried about your your laptop or or your phone, I mean, we're talking about devices that cost a lot of money for you to just go pick another one up and then go through the process of reinstalling everything and changing all the passwords and everything, and you know, implementing multi-factor authentication on everything and so on. Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> um, so. Back to this one's applicable to UV cameras. I know we've had this one a few times. Um, what is an effective way to set up security cameras across different floors in residential buildings without having to spend tons on hard wiring? Um, really, I mean, it's all wireless, right? You're going to have to use more wireless. So where you place your wireless access points uh, so that the cameras can communicate well through those access points. and and that would limit the, the amount of wiring that you have to do. Of course, there's a little bit of an, you know, you would, with anything wireless, you have a little bit more of an increased, increased risk because obviously wired is better, faster, and of course, a, little, a lot harder to get into. With wireless, there are multitude of different attacks and things that could be um, a bit of a headache, right? But as far as efficiency and, and being effective, it's ultimately going to be, using wireless, um, especially across big buildings and so on and so forth, where you have a lot of cameras set up. Um, and it's, of course, it's going to cost less. Uh, and, and again, there's, there's enough wireless and, you know, commercial wireless solutions and consumer wireless uh, options that can provide a, a, a pretty high standard of security. So that's the way to go. 
and then it goes back to what you mentioned earlier i guess if you have the foundation like your actual wi-fi and the router like prepared set up with the right passwords the right like not broadcasting yeah, thing. yeah you you have to have further you have to harden that environment like i said yeah. you know to make sure yeah. that it's especially for for home security and for for cameras you know yeah so this one i know this one's an interesting topic i i guess we're all um all especially at home everyone everyone now the trend is we all have cameras doorbells so i know most of the security devices that ufi sells are set up for local storage is local storage really that big of an advantage or difference maker it is um local storage is a big big uh i'd say difference maker right advantage is something the word i'd say is something you have to determine whether it's an advantage for you but it is a big difference right because uh, with most other um solutions out there there that data is going to the cloud and we have a joke in the you know sort of the a, a joke saying in in the cybersecurity business, which is there is no cloud. It's just someone else's computer, right? <laughs> it's someone else's hard drive. Right. That's what the cloud is. So do you do you want your computer? Do you want your data to to be on your hard drive, or do you want your data to be on someone else's hard drive? No, oh, even if that's someone else's, you know, Amazon or that's someone else's Google or whatever, it is still someone else's, right? And UP cameras and UP, it's, it's all local which again, it's neither on the camera or it's on a hard drive that sits locally within your home or your business. Um, and, and that's just the way you know, it really was, right? This whole move to cloud computing has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. So again, that's when I say advantage is a word that you should choose as, a, as the individual, um, whether you think it's an advantage for your data to be on the cloud or whether it should be sitting in, in your hard drive. But um, of course, you know, for a lot of businesses, um, like they use cloud computing. Um, they use it for other reasons, right? It's because the applications they use for things like that. But I'm a strong believer in in, in having the, the data local as much as possible, especially for this type of application. Um, in fact, I went through and you know, in my own mother and father's house, I went through and changed everything to 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 the UV cams because of that because now I know that at least everything sits locally in the house and it's not just being transmitted uh, constantly to the cloud. The other part about it that you have to keep in mind is what happens if your internet access is down? At least your cameras are still recording locally, yeah. right? You still yeah. have all of that, even if somebody cut off the internet. So that's another advantage to having it local. Nice, nice. And if anyone watching wants to learn more about that, just check out eufy.com um we've got a bunch of blogs about this you can go more in depth um it's a i know it's a huge topic online we see a lot of debates about it but hopefully that's answered some questions there um okay here's let me check out this question are are in route of firewall programs like netgear armor sufficient or even beneficial to stopping malware and other malicious activity yes they are in fact uh, only in the last few years have uh, have a lot of these routers and, 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 and wireless access points implemented firewalling capabilities into the router, uh, at least for specifically with with that in mind, with it stopping malicious traffic um, or, or potentially, you know, back doors and things like that. Um, so yes, it, it, they are. There's, there's the, the short answer is yes, use these features if your routers have these features because they, they do help with malicious activity and malware. <laughs> you answered that one so straight with yes <laughs> like that yes yeah <laughs> turn amazing. it on use it yeah um that one was straight over my head as well like i, I find these top these topics are so interesting to me because i think it's it's so like i think you've touched on it it's something a lot of us take take for granted you know like when when oh, we, totally. we feel like we've, we've got a password on our email and we think or even like our home yuffie cams and we think oh yeah that's safe so it's super yeah. interesting to learn like some of these little little bit more we can be doing to protect our, our data and protect Absolutely, from, like, man. you know as I, I mentioned again the ted talk as i say in there hey be the hacker not the hacked you're neither the hacker you're the hacked so learn how to be a hacker yeah um the final question we have actually um 
and again, I think you've touched on this already, is uh, what do you think is next after two-factor authentication? Is it passkey or something else? Uh, yes, I think, I mean, that's like I said, we're heading towards the use of, of, of passwordless, uh, passwordless world using passkeys and other technologies. Um, I, I know of, you know, a number of different startups that I've, I've been in contact with and looked at their technologies and how they're doing it, technologically speaking. Um, people understand that pass key mentality, mentality, everything's kept in a key, but there's other factors to it too. Like I said, I know of one that's actually using a pass key, but it's also using, um, information that's stored on your device, depending on the device. So the device is an identifier too, you know, things about the device. And it could be things like the screen size of the device, the, the you know, all these dif different little things that are exchanged that become part of the mechanism for authentication um so that's that's yeah i think you know it's just ultimately going to become a, a i think more user friendly i think the passwords are, are still not user friendly i mean i can't tell you how many times uh people just don't know their passwords they put it in once and they never put it in again so why have that if there's other mechanisms that are even better um and, and much more difficult to crack mm. yeah i get i guess we could we could go on for a long time but um Sadly, we've come to the end. I, I'm out of questions, but um, I just want to say thank you for your time this morning. Um, My pleasure. It's been it's been great learning about how to protect ourselves, local storage, the clouds. I think there's a lot to digest. Um, if anyone wants to know more, check out the blogs that Ralph's been uh, writing for Ufi. Uh, put the link down below. Um, Ralph, what's what's next? Where can people find you? Learn about what what you've got going on. I get around, man. I do a, you know, a lot of public speaking. So there's different events and conferences I'll go uh, and speak at on uh, different issues. And uh, and I, I foresee doing some more, even with Yuffie, at different events and whatnot. So I'll be around. Keep your eye out. Any nice. Years. Nice. Well, thanks for watching, everyone. And uh, see you again soon. Thank you.